Have you ever looked at those inexpensive Chinese carburetors on Amazon and wondered if they might work for the application you have? Well, today I'm going to install one of those on a steel MS-180C chainsaw to see if it can improve the high-speed performance of that saw. It's been giving us a little bit of trouble. Now, as always, take a look down below to the chapters if you want to skip through to the different areas of the video, things like disassembly, reassembly, cleaning, and ultimately running of the saw. But if you want to stick around and listen to me babble, by all means, please do. So sit down, have a drink, and enjoy Dino's Tinker Shed. When it comes to cutting lots and lots of wood, nothing can keep up with a gas-powered chainsaw. However, if your saw is a few years old and you're someone who doesn't use it very frequently, you may be running into problems with the way it performs. This saw, for instance, will not rev up. It'll start, just won't rev up. So today, we are going to replace the stock steel carburetor with an offshore Chinese carburetor that I bought on Amazon for $23 Canadian. And that includes a lot of great things like a new spark plug and oil and gas lines. Now you can see here the dealer wanted almost $210 to fix this and almost $360 for a replacement saw. And I realize they need to make money to survive, but I think for $23 we can try and get this saw running ourselves. Now, the MS-180 is a great little homeowner saw. It looks like a little professional saw, and ergonomically and a lot of the safety features are very similar to Still's more professional lines of saws, and it's really well worth the $23 investment for us to try and get this little guy running again. Now, before we get to the carburetor, I'm going to take a look at the spark arrestor on this saw. Now, because these are two-cycle saws and they burn oil, Sometimes if you idle it for too long or your mix isn't right, um, the spark arrestor screen underneath this cover here can get clogged up with unburnt hydrocarbons and it restricts the exhaust flow out of the saw. And this leads to the similar effect of not being able to rev up, not idling right. And it really is the right place to start with any of these small two cycle engines before you start digging into the carburetor. It's a lot easier to get this off and clean it than actually clean or replace a carburetor. So as I take this cover off, you're going to see the screen. It falls down near the bottom of my hand, and it's really clean. I have a feeling that the dealer probably cleaned this up to eliminate it out of the uh, potential problems that could be stopping this from revving out. And you can see there's still a fair amount of hydrocarbons on the back of this cover here, but it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Okay, I'm going to put this back together, and we're going to focus on the carburetor itself. So I want to take out the fuel tank first, and to do that, I need to take this shroud here off. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is grab a hold of the trigger interlock, and then I'm going to move the uni switch to the run position. And this allows me to then move the thumb switch to the left, and the shroud comes right off. Now, this exposes your air box and your air filter. So I'm going to pull the air filter off, and you're going to see this is pretty dirty. Now you can clean this with air and, uh, or a little brush, but I'm going to put a new one on. So let's set that aside. We'll pull off the spark plug here just to isolate the energy, and then we'll get ready to uh, take off the side covers. So to get this side panel and this fuel tank out, the first thing I'm going to do is take off the fuel cap. Now it comes off pretty easy, and I use a little hook tool to fish out this little device here that holds it in so you don't lose the cap. Now I'm going to drain this fuel out. Now you're going to see me drain it into a solo cup here and I immediately drain this off into the proper uh, steel vessel that this came from. Uh, this kind of fuel will melt these solo cups really quick. Now I'm going to do the same thing over here with the oil cap. Now I'm going to put the oil cap back on because we don't want to take that, that tank out. But to get the cover off you have to take the cap off first. There's a series of bolts and screws that run around this side cover. 
Now on these homeowner saws, there's a little more work to get this off than it is on a professional saw, but it eventually does come off. We just have to pop the inertia chain brake off there so that we can actually get the side panel off and it just slides off as a one piece unit. Now, I'm gonna put the oil cap back in here because we're gonna to have to put the saw back down onto its bottom part. And I try to get the clutch, or the, sorry, the, the choke lever off here and it just won't come. So I actually have to disassemble the air box to get this off of here. I need to pull the carb back a little bit to give me some free space. So the air box is actually held on with a couple um, eight millimeter uh, nuts that are onto some studs that hold the air box and the carb on here. And once you get those out, I used to use a magnet to get the nuts. You, they're pretty easy to find. You slide the air box off and here's the carburetor itself. So to get this off, you've got to first release the throttle trigger here. And what I do is I just hold it open and cycle the throttle a few times and eventually that throttle lever will pop off of there. There you go. That allows me to slide the car back just a bit and pull off the choke lever. And then you also have to take the control bar, this plastic control bar off. And, and this articulates your choke and your on off switch, which is that little wire that's connected there. So it just pops up and then you wiggle it back like this and it just kind of tucks out of the way. And that gives you access to get the fuel line off which is really all we really needed to do to get the tank out, but with everything in the way, I just couldn't do it. So here you go, and out comes the tank. Okay, now that we have the tank out, I'm gonna use that same hook tool that I used to get the cap out and fish out the filter, and I'm gonna pry that off with a screwdriver. Now, I'm not keeping either the fuel line or the fuel filter here, it came in the kit, but you still have to take it out. So it basically just pulls out like this. I note the orientation of the fuel pipe. You can see it's a bit of a custom bend there. And I compare it to the new pipe to make sure that I'm dealing with the same kit. Sure enough, they're identical. So I twist it back into the hole here. It's a little tight to get in, so I sort of pull it up and wiggle it on the bottom. And then ultimately I use a screwdriver gingerly here just to move it in uh, properly to seat it and then I orient the pipe the same way it came out of the saw. I put on the brand new fuel filter and I put it back into the uh, to the tank, make sure it's oriented right and that the fuel filter is sitting properly with no kinks in the hose here. Looks good. Okay now it's just a matter of reassembly so I'll put the tank back in, feed the hose the same way it came out and slide it back onto the carburetor. Now I'm just putting this back together right now to make sure everything fits and that it aligns properly. I'm gonna have to take the fuel filter off again when I go to take the carb off. So I snap everything back down, we put all the screws back in, and from here um, it's just basically a reverse of how you took it off. I have to take the, fuel tank, the, the oil cover off again obviously so we put that back on. And then we don't over tighten these, they're just into plastic. It's just snug is all you really need. And it uh, goes together pretty easily. And finally I put back on the fuel cap. So the new carburetor slides off relatively easily now. And that exposes the overall area where uh, we need to clean. So I'm gonna put on a nitro glove and I'm gonna cover the intake uh, port right here and I'm going to use a little bit of compressed air to blow out the dirt. Now you definitely need to wear a glove. The compressed air can be dangerous but we're just going to clean the area out gently to get all the loose debris out. Now let's have a look here at what comes in the kit. Now I already have shown you the the fuel pipe but uh, here's an overall breakdown of what came in the kit. So we've got both an oil and a fuel fi uh, 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 pipe. We've got an air filter, a fuel filter, an oil filter, and even new gaskets, which is great. And the carburetor itself was nicely packed in bubble wrap. I mean, the overall kit looked great for $23. This is, this is great. Shipped right to my door, and that's Canadian, not even U.S. funds. So when we do look at the two carburetors, they are remarkably similar. The left is obviously the original because it's still a little bit dirty, but... I couldn't really see too much difference other than on the bottom of the carburetor where there was slight differences in the shape of this part. 
But other than that, they looked relatively close. I mean, look at them. I measured them out. They fit really well. Everything looked good. There's only one thing that I saw, and that was this little spring here needed to be pushed forward so the throttle linkage would slide into that groove. And the gaskets looked really good too. They were nice, cleanly cut. They fit well. They lined up with all the ports. So let's put this on. So first we slide the gasket, and then we're going to slide on the carburetor and hook up all the linkages again. This is just the reverse order of how these came off, so we'll just follow, follow backwards. Finally, we'll put on the second gasket and the air box, which I probably could have cleaned a little better by the looks of it here. And we're going to tighten this down. It doesn't need to be super duper tight, just nice and snug. You don't want to strip these studs out. I'm going to put the spark plug cap back on and the brand new air filter here. And then we're ready to put the shroud back on. So we're going to grab the, uh, the uh, switch and put it back into the run position. And then the shroud can just slide back down on there push it down gently and then move the thumb lever over to the right and now the shroud is locked on. Now we're going to add a little bit of uh, pre-mixed engineered fuel here at 50 to 1 which is what this particular steel runs and we should be ready to run it. Okay let's try. Well I installed the new uh, offshore Chinese made carburetor. I changed the fuel line and the fuel filter pickup and I cleaned out all of the junk that I possibly could. I put a new air filter in it. It seems to still have that mid-range bog. So it'll idle well, and if I can get through the bog with a little bit of fancy finger uh, trigger action, I can get to the high speed settings where it seems to run pretty good. Now the problem with these carburetors, both the, the steel carburetor and the one that I bought is, there is no adjustment for high and low speed settings. So an older carburetor on an older professional saw would have had a low and a high speed uh, throttle adjustment that you could sort of tune out that bog by adjusting the richness or leanness of the fuel mixture. So I think what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take the original carburetor, which did run well at one point, and dismantle it, take a look at the diaphragms, all of that, and then I'm going to run it through my ultrasonic cleaner and then reassemble it and see if it works. If that doesn't work, I might take it apart and use the internal components from the new one. The saw's just sitting here doing nothing. I'm just tinkering to see if I can get it to work. And I want to do it as cheap as I can. So let's try that next.
So what are my thoughts on this little carburetor here? Was it worth buying? Well, I think it was for a bit of fun and to see if it would run, but in reality it didn't really perform the way that I expected it to, and in the end I just went back and cleaned the carburetor itself, the original carburetor, on the chainsaw and got it to run. So that doesn't mean that they're no good. I've seen a lot of people online that have had really good luck with these and I'd probably try one again. And maybe farting around with it a little bit, tinkering with it a little bit, I might be able to get it to work. But um, the original factory carburetor seems to be performing really good now that I've put it through the ultrasonic cleaner. It is important to note that the carburetor that came on the still was made in China, the same as this. And I'll bet you any money they're made either in the same factory or in an affiliate factory because they're just too similar to be, to be a, um, a mistake there or a, or a coincidence. So that brings us up to the topic of how do you keep your saw from giving you trouble moving forward? I'm going to take a step back and assume that maybe you don't want to fix your saw. You want to buy a new one. I would strongly suggest that you take a look at what you're going to be doing with the saw before you go and buy another one. Are you using it twice, three times a year at most at your hunting camp or maybe at your cabin or your cottage? If that's the case, you may really want to look at a battery powered saw or at least a corded saw if you do have electricity at your cabin or camp. Now they're not as fast, uh, at least most of the consumer uh, sort of level saws like this Ego here, they don't cut quite as quick as a gas powered saw. I'm not going to say that they do, but you don't have to deal with the gasoline, the mixing of the gas and oil, and if you buy something like a DeWalt or a Milwaukee, they, a lot of their battery packages will transition onto a, a, a battery powered chainsaw that they manufacture. So you don't have to continually buy batteries. You may already have, like me, 8 or 10 or 12 batteries kicking around for your battery platform that can transition right away into a battery powered saw. And if all you're doing is clearing a few shooting lanes or maybe a bit of deadfall down near the dock, this might be the route to go. Now. If this is not an option and you still need a gas saw, there's a few things that you'll want to look at. First of all, you should be burning nothing but premium grade fuel in any of these high performance small gas engines. And the reason you want to do that is the 91 and 94 octane helps with pre-detonation, but more importantly, these types of gasolines don't have ethanol in them. Even though the manufacturers will say that modern gas powered chainsaws can handle ethanol, I know of no small engine mechanic that will endorse ethanol in any of these. Straight gasoline is what runs best. It doesn't damage the internal components and you'll get much longer service life if you simply burn premium fuels all the time. And only buy enough fuel for what your job task is. So if you're going to run this for a couple weeks while you're up at the camp, buy enough gas to last for that time and no more. So you may only be buying a couple liters, maybe a gallon at a time, but you won't have old gas that you bring up next year expecting it to perform well in your saw. You'll be doing yourself a great justice by buying less and, and really um, using it up every season. Now if you do have to have uh, fuel for extended time, maybe you're going up for a, a four or five weeks for a hunting trip, then consider adding something like Stabil, a fuel stabilizer to your gasoline. Now I add Stabil to all of my small engine uh, gas cans and I really only have the lawnmower and the snowblower now. I buy two gallons at a time and I add Stabilizer to it and I use it throughout the season. If I'm not burning gas to cut the grass, I'm burning it to throw the snow. So there is some debate online whether fuel stabilizers really are all that effective or really do anything. I've had good luck with it, so for me I use it. But you go out and do some research. There's lots of information online that can help you make a decision whether a fuel stabilizer is something you want to use. 
Now, I really think that if you're gonna still use a gas saw and you're gonna use it intermittently, like we talk about, then technical fuels like this are a great option. So these technical fuels are manufactured by many different manufacturers, Poulon, I think still even has their own brand now. And these are um, a high quality gasoline, high test gasoline combined with a fuel stabilizer and pre-mixed with the right amount of oil and additives for small equipment like this. The nicest thing about them is they're very shelf stable. You can buy four or five cans of this, put it on the shelf and it's good for a year or so. I think there's even a due date on them that tells you when they, when they should be used by. But they're really good, especially like if you're into prepping, that kind of stuff. This type of stuff works good. You do pay a premium, don't get me wrong. This can here I think was $6. This one was $5 um, per liter. So that's uh, almost $20 a gallon. But if you're only buying a liter or two a year, the cost and the peace of mind knowing that it's mixed right really, really, really does pay dividends. Now, no matter what fuel you use, at the end of the season or the end of your hunting trip or the end of that big storm cleanup around your house, drain the fuel out of your saw before you put it away for long-term storage. Um, drain it into an approved container, don't put it into a red pixie cup like I did, and then run the saw until it dies out and chokes out and won't start again. What that does is it cleans all of the fuels out of, this, out of the uh, fuel lines and out of the tank and out of the carburetor so that varnishes don't build up as easily within the carburetors. It's one of the best things you can do to try and get long life out of these saws. And if it's going to be stored for more than maybe a couple months, consider using something like a fogging oil. So fogging oil can be sprayed either down through the spark plug or it can even be ingested while the saw is running through the air intake and it coats the cylinder and the lower parts of the crank with a sticky oil that helps rust um, not build up and it basically protects the internal components of your saw so you don't get a, a stiction between the rings and the, um, the cylinder wall itself. This can's been pretty dusty because I used to use it all the time when I had two-stroke snowmobiles. I would fog my cylinders every single spring and uh, make sure they run well. So basically spray it through the spark plug hole, cycle the cylinder a few times with a pull cord, put spark plug back in, it's good to go. It'll smoke like crazy when you start it up, but honestly, it's good protection. So. I guess that kind of wraps this episode up. It's probably run a little bit long. I really do appreciate everybody stopping by and I really appreciate all the comments I've been getting, especially things on safety um, and, and just general overall structure of the channel. I think it's, uh, it's um, really important that you get that feedback, both positive and negative, so you can help to build a good community around in one of these YouTube channels. So keep those kinds of comments coming. So I hope this was helpful for everybody out there. If it was, tune in next time you see a video. Come on by and visit a little bit. And I'll see you and everyone else again on Dino's Tinker Shed.